Romans chapter 7, verse 1 through 6. The law and us. So Paul is talking about the law, and he's talking about being uh, dead to the law and uh, under grace rather than under the law, like that. And uh, so he just continues to do that. Now when he gets uh, along later on, he's going to give us some advice as to how to live, uh, even though we're not under the law. I've got, I think I've got three points here tonight to bring to you. The first one is the force of the law, verse 1 through 3. Look at verse 1 now. Know ye not, brethren, for I speak to them that know the law, how that the law hath dominion over a man as long as he liveth. Um, now Romans 6.14 says that sin hath no more dominion over you. So he's repeating himself here again as he's been doing all along. He wants these people to know what he's talking about, so he keeps re repeating himself. But if you know the law, you know that it has dominion as long as you live. Uh, we have natural law, and we have mosaic law. And in their uh, time, both of these had dominion over us. And uh, they don't have dominion over the Christian, over the believer. In other words, they can't condemn them. That's what that means. It doesn't mean there is no law for us. It means it doesn't condemn us. Now look at verse 2. For the woman which hath an husband is bound by the law to her husband so long as he liveth. But if the husband be dead, she is loosed from the law of her husband. So Paul picks out one law, just one law by itself, and uses it as an illustration of how that we are under the laws as long as we live in these bodies. And so there's an example from the law itself, picking one out, just one law about the husband and the wife. As long as the husband is alive, the woman is under the law of her husband. And that's God's standard. Now, I know Moses made an exception to that, and we make exceptions to it in our day and time. Moses uh, allowed them to divorce, and so on and so forth. And God said that he did it because of the hardness of their heart. And so today, we don't believe that if somebody gets diver divorced, that they're lost, and they, they uh, are under the condemnation of the law. And so uh, even as Moses, under that strict law, gave an exception, we give exception today. But he's not teaching us that. He's not teaching us about marriage. He's teaching us about the severity of the law and how that is, its uh, dominion is on a person as long as that person lives. And the husband here is the law. He's a picture of the law. Verse 3 says, So then, if while her husband liveth, she be married to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. But if her husband be dead, she is free from that law. So he's just picking that one law. So that she is no adulteress, though she be married to another man. Now, he's using a Mosaic law that, uh, and, and well, actually from the very beginning, that, uh, that a man is to leave uh, his mother and father and cleave to his wife, and that's a lifelong deal. To a man and a woman to get married and be married for life, and that was the way God laid it down. In the Mosaic law, it was the same way, and he made an exception, as I said, for that. So when the husband dies, it releases her. So she's no, that law... Of marriage has no more dominion over her. And the reason is the man is dead. See? And that's what he's going to use in a minute or two about, and even in the next lesson, more specifically, I think, uh, about being not, the, not under the law. We're not under the condemnation of the law. We're not under dominion of the law. But if her husband's dead, I mean, what's she going to do? You know, she can't, she can't be attached to him forever until she dies, because he's dead. I mean, that's not, that doesn't even make good sense, does it? And so, the same with the law. But we're going to find out that the law is not dead. Well, I'll, I'll explain that as we go along, uh, either this lesson or the next lesson, because we're going to have to continue it on the next time. Uh, now, verse 4 and 5, the fruit of the law. That's the force of the law. It's dominion over a person as long as he lives. And this is the fruit of the law. Verse 4 says, Wherefore, my brethren, ye also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ, 
that you should be married to another, even to him who was raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. I want you to go back now to Genesis, and uh, let's read a few verses here, chapter 1, in relation to this, especially of bringing fruit unto God. You see, in the flesh, we can't bring fruit unto God, because it's all flesh. Now, in verse 26, Genesis 1, And God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. Now that was the dominion that God gave man over the creation. Verse 27, so God created man in his own image and the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. And God blessed them and God said unto them, be fruitful and multiply and replenish or fill. That's what that word means, to fill the earth and subdue it. In other words, put it under you. You take care of it. You're the boss. You take care of the earth. Don't destroy it, but you uh, nurture it and so on. Fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. So when man was created, he was created to have dominion over the earth. So one of the purposes of marriage, because see, they were supposed to replenish the earth. They were supposed to have children and children and children and children. And children. Um, I, I started to tell you something I'm not going to tell you because it's going out on video, but it's a little funny. and I, I, It's a little sensitive, so I'm not going to say it, but it's a little funny about about this, uh, you know, replenishing the earth. So one of the purposes of marriage is so that man will replenish the earth. In other words, to be fruitful in the flesh. You know, some people have two kids, some have one, some have 12, some have 15. I heard of one woman had 52 children. But she was married to three or four different men, and she had 52 children. Can you imagine a woman birthing 52? Well, she'd have to live to be 95 probably. I don't know. She must have had one every year. I don't know. But, but God built us that way that we would reproduce children and replenish the earth. And that's what we're supposed to do. And it relates to the law. Um, we are dead to the law just as the husband is dead in Paul's illustration that he gave of marriage. So we're dead to the law to be free from the law so that we might marry another We've talked about this before. And the other one that we are to marry is Jesus Christ. Because he describes him there. It says, even to him who is raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto him. We cannot produce fruit, spiritual fruit unto God, until we're born again. Because we're, we're under the law. And we are part of the law before we're saved, and all we can do is produce fleshly things, earthly things, not heavenly things, until we're saved. And that's what Paul's talking about. We need to be married to another. Now we're married, as a lost person, we're married to the world. We're married to the devil's uh, uh, workshop, you might say, because he's the, he's the prince and the power of the air. He runs the world system, and we're not supposed to be married to him in that way. And so when we're saved, we're dead to the law, to that law, and now we're married to another, and we can produce fruit uh, unto God. And, and that's the very purpose of being married to Christ, is to bring forth fruit unto God. Now, these are the fruit of the Spirit. Let's go to Galatians chapter 5, if you'll take a minute to do that, please. There is a fruit in the flesh, and there's a fruit in the Spirit. And we, as God's people, we want to produce spiritual fruit, not carnal fruit, not fleshly fruit. We have to be careful about that. And we'll talk about that as we go along, how that it is so easy to do that, even though we're married to Christ, sometimes we produce some pretty fleshly fruit. He says in verse 22 of Galatians 5, But the fruit of the Spirit is... Now, you notice that's a singular word, fruit. 
sort of like grapes. I love grapes. And there's a whole bunch of them. And we call them grapes, plural. Uh, but I, I uh, Jackson and Perkins, years ago, when I was just young, I hadn't left home yet, I got their uh, magazine every month. And uh, they put that smell on her, all the flowers and the blooms and all that kind of... And, and there, one time they had this tree that produced five kinds of apples. One tree, five kinds of apples. Just one tree. So this is one fruit, but look what it produces. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. <laughs> The Spirit produces all of that. And that's the fruit that we give to God as we live for the Lord and do His will. We produce this fruit of the Spirit. Actually, it's the work of the Spirit that produces it, but He uses us to do that. And then at the last of that verse, notice what it says. Against such there is no law. So these can't be sin. If there were no law, there would be no sin. Well, there's no law against this. So none of this is a sin, can't be a sin, can't become sin. But they're all wonderful things, and there's no law against them. Isn't that great? Now, I'll just read to you Ephesians 5, 9, unless you want to hurry over there. It says, For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth. So instead of a law against them, it is for goodness and righteousness and truth. Now, let's look in our text again. Let's go back to verse number five. For when we were in the flesh, now we know that, that means before we were born again, before we were saved by God's grace. When we were in the flesh, the motions of sins which were by the law, did work in our members to bring forth fruit unto death. Before we were saved, our fruit was unto death. Because this flesh is not going to last forever, it's going to die. So we're not producing anything that's eternal. We're not producing any true love and joy and peace and long-suffering, gentleness and goodness and faith and all those things. No, we're, we're producing... Uh, in the motions of sin that we commit, we're bringing forth fruit unto death. And uh, so Paul brings out in this verse our used-to-be fruit, you know, what we used to produce when we were in the flesh. And I think we could put in there in the flesh only and not in the Spirit of God. Because later on we're going to find out that he's going to mention to us more specifically that when we're saved, we also still have the flesh. But he's going to talk about that later. And so we're saved, we have flesh. That's all we have. Carnal mind, carnal body, fleshly desires, lust, all that kind of stuff. So the motions of sin were in the flesh. And they were condemned by the law. That's why they were sins. Because there's a law against those things that are sin. There were no law, they wouldn't be sinned at all. That's what, the, what Paul says. But there is a law, so those things were sinned. Against the fruit of the Spirit, there is no law against it, so it can't be sinned. And these motions worked in our fleshly members to bring us fruit unto death. There could be no fruit in the flesh, no salvation in the flesh, no pleasing God in the flesh. Um... The Bible tells us in the book of Matthew, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. And they were astonished out of measure, saying among themselves, who then can be saved? So if you can't produce salvation in your flesh, if you can't do good things to be saved, then who can be saved? That's a good question. Isn't it? The disciples asking that. He goes on to say, and Jesus looking up, Upon them saith, what uh, with men, it is impossible. Nobody can be saved in the flesh. It's impossible. But not with God. For with God, all things are possible. 
And so God is everything in our salvation. We have no part in it as far as working and doing and all of that. And so we need to be thankful that God worked in our hearts, brought us to salvation, gave us faith to believe, uh, convicted us of our sins and saved our souls. And we need to be eternally thankful for those things. Now, verse 6, freed from the law. It says, but now we are delivered from the law. That being dead wherein we were held, that we should serve in newness of spirit and not in the oldness of the law. So there's a newness in the spirit. Now, you'll notice that word spirit there. The translators left it a small s, which means our spirit. It doesn't mean the Holy Spirit. It means our spirit. I think they're correct in doing that. In the Greek, there is no capital in lowercase. If there is capital, everything's capital. <laughs> Have you ever noticed people writing their, their texts on Facebook or, or email or something and they'll put everything in caps? I hate that. I, it's so hard to read when everything is in caps. When I took Greek, I learned to read Greek in what they call the minuscules or the lowercase letters. And all of a sudden, I saw something in all caps and, and, they call, uh, and those were the ones that a lot of the manuscripts were written in and later on in all caps. And I couldn't read it because they're not the same as the lowercase ones. Uh, but the Bible says here there is a newness in that spirit. So this small s means there's a newness in our spirit. Not a newness. So there's never any newness in the Holy Spirit, is there? And not in the oldness of the law. So our spirit, once we're saved, is a new spirit the old spirit is the oldness of the letter. That's the law. So the old spirit is under the law and under the condemnation of the law and under the condemnation of sin. But when we're saved, we have a new spirit. And they live together in us, which we'll talk about uh, in detail in a little while. And so we have the new spirit and we have the old flesh. We don't have an old spirit and a new spirit. We have a new spirit and an old flesh. So, through justification, he's delivered us. And it's interesting, this word deliver is the same word as rescue. He's going to rescue us. So the Lord comes along and rescues us from being under the law, from being dead in sin and in darkness and in the world and in the flesh. So he comes along and rescues us. We don't run to him to get into his arms and love him. And no, he comes and gets us. Because we're in the world. We don't know anything but the world. We don't understand spiritual things at all. So we're not, we're not about to save ourselves or come to the place where we can approach him. He approaches us. Amen. And he comes and gets us and he rescues us. Have you ever seen a chicken hawk catch a chicken? Well, or even something everybody would know about is, uh, is one of those seagulls or whatever birds that fly around the ocean. They come down, they get that fish, pick it up. That fish is not looking for that bird. That fish is not wanting that bird to come and get it. No, but that bird comes and snatches him, but he's not saving him. He's eating him. <laughs> but that's what the Lord does to us. He comes and snatches us. He rescues us from the world. And the Bible says when we're lost, we're in darkness. We can't see any spiritual things. So he has to open our eyes, give us a new spirit, make us, us alive because we're dead in our sins and trespasses. Ephesians 2, 1 tells us. And uh, so he says, we're dead concerning the law wherein we were held. See, the law was holding us down. The law had dominion over us. The law was our boss. And here we are under this law, no way of escape. And God comes along with his word and the gospel and it comes to us and he snatches us away and, and rescues us, puts us into his kingdom and into his family. Well, that's a wonderful thing, isn't it? And uh, the word delivered in this verse can also mean to make void. So he made the law void of its power. 
Its power was it had dominion over us. Its power was it was killing us. But then when God saved us, he made the law void to us. Has no more power over us. So being dead, we should serve in newness of spirit. In newness of spirit. So he says that we should serve in newness of spirit. So if we're... If, we're, if we have a new spirit and if we have a new life and we have a sight that we can see spiritual things and understand spiritual things, why would we ever want to go back under the law and, and, and it have dominion over us? Why would we do that? Paul calls it the beggarly elements of the world. We don't want to do that. But then there are a lot of Christians who don't understand that. They want God to bless them and they want God to be their God and to deliver them and all like that. But they want to fool around with the beggarly elements of the world. They don't go together. You can't serve two masters. Because you'll either love the one and hate the other. Or you'll look at one and, and like the one and despise the other one. You can't love two things that are different. Exactly opposite practically. And so in newness of spirit... Uh, and in newness of life, and not in the oldness of the letter or the law. Now, the, the Bible teaches us that the law is old, and it is. It's old. But in the New Testament, tell, it tells us that it was passing away. It was pa the, the ceremonial law was passing away. Because when Jesus died, the ceremonial law wasn't even needed anymore. That's why I don't, I don't look for the Jews to build a temple. Now, you can believe what you want to about it, and I don't really care. You, you can believe they'll build two or three temples, as far as I'm concerned. But why would God want the Jews to build a temple and go through the ceremonial law when the Bible says it has been done away with? Why would the, the Lord revive that old law again to bring it up to the Jews to, to picture a coming of a Messiah when they're still looking for him when he's already come and done all the work, I don't understand it. Now they might build a temple. Now they could. It'd be, they, they tell me, Jews tell me, some of them tell me that it would be very easy to do. They could do it in a little bit of no time. If the situation was right, they could do it in just almost no time at all. And they may do that. But I can't believe that God wants them to do that in order to picture the coming of the Messiah because the Messiah is already here. All that would do is make them look farther for him to come in a future time. They're looking for him to come down and set up his kingdom. So I don't know. You can do whatever you want to with that. I might even be wrong. I don't know. Uh, but it's just the way I... Because the, old, the, the, the law is old. It's done away with. And especially to the believer. Because when the Lord saved us, he did away with the dominion of the law. He do, don't have dominion over us anymore. It's as if the law doesn't exist. Now, I'm not talking about the speed limit. I'm not talking about laws like that. I'm not talking about natural law. You know, because we still have to keep that law. Those laws, because the Bible says that when we're saved, we establish the law. We're not supposed to be sinners. We're not supposed to go out here and say... These laws don't apply to me because I'm a Christian and I'm just going to do whatever I want to. He said it establishes the law. So we as human beings are still under that law, but it doesn't have dominion over us anymore. It can't condemn us at all. I'm glad the law is gone. I'm glad Jesus came. I'm glad that's over with and done. And I'm glad that I can look forward to just going to be with him one day. And I'm looking forward to that, aren't you? Amen. I'm looking to be with the Lord Jesus Christ. We had that funeral yesterday, and, and you know, uh, I was thinking about this. I, I wasn't going to preach it, but I was thinking about it when I was studying. And I was thinking, you know, the Bible says it's better to go to the house of mourning than to the house of laughter. And you know why? Because you go to the house of laughter, it's so you'll forget things. You go to the house of mourning to remember things. When you go to the house of mourning, especially like a funeral or something, you go there to remember stuff. Remember a lot, the love one that you lost or, or remember whatever the mourning would be about to remember. And not only that, but to remember that God can bring you out of that mourning 
and into a place of joy, not just laughter, but joy in your heart. And so that's where we are as God's people. And I'm thankful. Let's stand together.